Take a couple of good long, deep in and out breaths. Where do you feel the breath? Try to be with that sensation and with nothing else. Ride the sensation all the way in, all the way out. And if you're going to do any thinking, think about the breath. Think about that sensation. We're trying to get the breath in and of itself. Which means that we're putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world. Any thoughts about the world outside, just put them aside right now. They don't belong here. You just want that sensation. Thoughts of sensuality, thoughts of anger, thoughts of whatever. Think of them as like clouds. They come by and they can go away. And they don't have to have much substance. We're the ones who give them substance. We turn them into worlds, what the Buddha calls becoming. And if you get into a becoming like that, you've gone astray. When we're working on the concentration, even though concentration is a state of becoming, we're focusing on the raw materials. Just the breath. Just your mind talking to itself about the breath. Then there'll be a perception you hold in mind, an image you hold in mind about the breath. And then the feeling. How does the breath feel right now? Does it feel comfortable? The Buddha talks about perception and feeling as being mental fabrications and the impact they have on the mind. But they also have an impact on the breath. The way you picture the breath to yourself will have an impact on how it feels, where the sensations are, the sensations that you notice. Since developing a heart condition, I've discovered that the breath sensations in the area around the heart can be very complex. It's like a maze. As you breathe in, some of the breath sensations inside the heart seem to be going up, others seem to be going down. And you want to make sure you don't get in their way. Now you may notice that. You may notice other things in your sensation of the breath in the body right now. Now, you may find other areas in the body that are complex for you. The important thing is that you're really sensitive to what's going on, sensitive to what feels good, and also sensitive to how your perceptions might be getting in the way of its feeling even better. This is why John Fung said that when you meditate, you're playing. You play with your sensations, you play with your perceptions. In other words, you try different things out. One of the words he often used was, use your imagination and be observant. If as you breathe in, there are parts of the body where the breath energy seems to go up and it feels like it's running against something, well, think of it going down. Maybe it shouldn't be going up. Maybe your perception is forcing it up. So as you see, even though you're with the sensation of breathing, there are other things that are going on as well. You're thinking about the breath, you're experimenting, you're evaluating things. But it's all gathered around this one sensation, and that's what matters. The word the Buddha uses for a concentrated mind, egaka, or egakata, means basically having one gathering point, one gathering spot. There are different activities going on in the mind, but they're all gathered around here. 
You look at his definition for the factors of jhana. Singleness of preoccupation, directed thought, evaluation, pleasure, rapture. Five things. But what keeps them from being five, what makes them one, is the fact they're all gathered around the one object, that singleness of preoccupation. The other factors are there, just helping things along. You might say, well, I thought we were talking about mindfulness, and now we're talking about jhana. The Buddha doesn't make a clear distinction between the two. In the description of the first jhana, he says you're secluded from sensuality and from unskillful thoughts. Well, think about that passage where the Buddha is talking about mindfulness. He compares it to the quail that wanders away from its field and gets caught by the hawk. And this is being carried off. It says, oh, my lack of merit. If only I had stayed in my ancestral field, my ancestral range, this hawk would have been no match for me. The hawk gets a little peeved. Here's this quail bragging. So he lets him go. He says, okay, go to your ancestral field, but you won't escape me. So the quail flies down, and his ancestral field is a field that's been newly plowed, with the stones turned up. He stands on one of the stones, and he starts taunting the hawk. Come get me, you hawk. Come get me, you hawk. And the hawk swoops down, and when the quail sees that it's coming at full speed, it hides behind the stone, and the hawk shatters his breast on the stone. As the Buddha said, the, the field there stands for the four establishings of mindfulness, and the area outside of the field stands for thoughts of sensuality. All too often we hear that mindfulness is a matter of just letting the mind go wherever it's going to go, and you simply keep track of it where it's wandering. You don't place any restrictions on it. You're totally accepting of whatever comes up. But here the Buddha is saying no. When mindfulness is really established properly, it stays within its field. It doesn't go out wandering in thoughts of sensuality. There's another passage where the Buddha is describing the stages of the practice. And it's a standard list of the stages, except for one deviation. Where ordinarily the Buddha would be talking about the first jhana, he talks about the four establishings of mindfulness. So he says, for example, you stay focused on the body in and of itself, ardent, alert, and mindful, putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world. And then when you can do that, then the Buddha says, okay, stay focused on the body in and of itself, but don't think any discursive thoughts related to the body, or feelings, or mind, or mind states. And from putting aside discursive thinking, you go into the second jhana. He's basically saying that you establish mindfulness, it's equivalent to the first jhana. And John Lee likes to talk about how ev evaluation and directed thought are related to ardency and alertness. That's the evaluation. And then mindfulness, which is a directed thought. In other words, the three qualities that accompany the practice of right mindfulness, they get turned into factors of jhana. So it's one smooth, seamless practice. It's not like you do mindfulness practice and then you stop doing mindfulness practice and then you start doing concentration. As you're doing mindfulness right, the mind gets into right concentration. So you stay right here, simply that you get more solidly right here, more sensitive right here. And as you've been working with the breath, you get a sense of ease, a sense of fullness. As you allow the breath energies to go whatever directions they want, John Lee says sometimes they like to spin around in place, sometimes they go up, sometimes they go down. Well, keep those options in mind as possibilities, so that your cartoon ideas of how the breath works don't get in the way of 
making it really nice. And as you get more and more sensitive to what's going on, you know, that factor of evaluation, that turns into discernment. Here again, I've, on these Zoom meetings that I, that I lead sometimes, kind of every now and then we get someone who comes from a very different tradition moving in. They like to talk about, well, you do concentration practice, then you drop the concentration, and then you do insight. But again, there's no clear line drawn between the two. What is insight? Basically doing concentration with a lot of sensitivity. And the Buddha calls it having your theme well in hand. And the image he gives is of a person sitting looking at someone lying down, or a person standing looking at someone who's sitting. They're right next to each other. But one is a little bit above, watching what's going on. As you start getting more and more sensitive to your concentration, you begin to see, oh, there are aggregates there. There's the different fabrications. They're all there. All the things you're going to need for insight, they're right there. You don't need to go anyplace else. So you've got mindfulness, concentration, discernment, all in one convenient location. And just that thought should help get you even more focused. You don't have to say, well, I'm going to do mindfulness for a while, and then, gee, when do I switch to concentration, and then when do I switch to insight? Those are not decisions you have to make. Everything comes together right here. It's just a question of being more and more sensitive right here. and yet allowing your imagination to expand right here as to what's possible.